So hello everyone and welcome to this session of the Permit COE webinar series. Today, Sarah Peter is going to talk about data protection and privacy preservation in software development. My name is Daniel Tomas Lopez. I am involved in Permit COE on behalf of Embel BI, and I am going to host this webinar. Before starting, I would like to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded, including the questions and answers section, and that the recording will be disseminated afterwards. After the presentation, we will have time for questions, so please use the Q&A button in your Zoom panel for asking questions during the webinar. And please note that all materials are licensed under a CC BY uh, 4.0 license, uh, except where further licensing details are provided. Let me now quickly introduce, introduce Permit COE. Permit COE is the HPC Exascale Center of Excellence for Personalized Medicine in Europe. Permit COE focuses on the simulation of cellular mechanistic models, which are essential to translate omics data into medical actions. The performance of cell simulation software nowadays is still not enough to address problems such as tumor evolution or finding personalized treatments for patients. So Permit COE is going to scale up the software uh, for cell simulations to the exascale system in order to enable the creation of models of uh, medical relevance. Permit COE will achieve this goal through a series of, of objectives. First, by optimizing uh, cell level simulation software to run in pre scale platforms. Second, by developing a series of use cases that will showcase the applications of Permit COE products in clinical fields, such as drug synergies for cancer treatments or multi-scale modeling of COVID-19 virus and patient's tissue. Additionally, Permit COE also has as objectives training the biomedical professionals, integrating the permit communities, and building the basis for the sustainability of Permit COE. Let me now introduce our speaker. Sarah Peter studied bioinformatics and worked for a few years as a researcher and data manager at the Max Planck Institute. Now she works at the Luxembourg Center for Systems Biomedicine at the University of Luxembourg as an infrastructure engineer in the R3 and IT infrastructure team. She's also the liaison for the HPC team. And since GDPR has come into effect, she spent some of her time doing risk analysis for the Institute's IT infrastructure and the HPC cluster. So Sarah, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Okay, so um, as Daniel already introduced, uh, this uh, webinar will be about data protection and privacy preservation in software development. Um, so short overview, I will give first a short introduction on the topic. Then I will highlight a few vulnerabilities that we commonly have in software. And then I will explain some general software development best practices and then some guidelines how to handle data in applications and also quickly um, say a few words about the environment and about procedures, policies, training and awareness. Um, so why is this important? Why is security uh, important? So besides the general maybe moral side of being a researcher and a software developer, there's also clear legal guidance on dealing with data. Namely, in the EU, this is the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. I will highlight two articles here. Uh, first, there's Article 5, which explains the principles relating to personal data processing. And there it's explicitly mentioned that appropriate measures must be taken to ensure data security and prevent unauthorized access or disclosure. And there's also a lot of other points about how to handle with data, um, which I will not go into detail. Uh, and there's also a second article, um, 25, which is titled Data Protection by Design and Default. And here the regulation says that data controllers are required to implement technical and organizational measures to ensure data protection is integrated into systems and processes by design. So this is all very abstract. If we now go basically completely to the other side, the very technical 
uh, viewpoint. Um, so if you talk about uh, information security, usually there are three items which you are concerned with. This is the confidentiality, the integrity, and the availability of your data. So the goal is that these three um, aspects are preserved. Now, if we move a bit more again into the direction on how GDPR views these issues, um, then um, also specifically, since we are here for uh, Center of Excellence in Personalized Medicine, the expectation is that you probably deal with personalized data, you deal with health data, which is usually considered sensitive by GDPR. So this all requires very strict um, security. Uh, then the danger with dealing with this type of data in this kind of environment is, for example, even though you might just have uh, genomic information or other information, um, not the name of the person, there's still a chance that by the information you have, you might be able to identify a person. Especially if, for example, you're dealing with a relatively small group of people. For example, if you would do like screening here in Luxembourg, which is not a very big country, and then you only have a handful of people maybe with a certain condition. And then if you have additional information on top of maybe a health status, it might be easy to um, re-identify persons from this information. Um, you might also be able to profile um, their behavior or their, their health status and other information, again, by basically grouping different data sources um, and isolating in people in groups. And if you think about the long-term perspective, um, usually the idea is to provide guidance for uh, treating people, also guidance for research. And it would be very bad if you make errors in your decisions. So it might be bad for the patient which might get the wrong treatment and also bad for your research integrity if the real results turn out to be false. Also in both cases, there's considerable overhead and damage if you need to recover from these errors. <clears throat> so since we are <clears throat> focusing here on um, high performance computing environments, there's a few additional items to be aware of in this type of environments, um, which differ from your local laptop, for example. So it's a the HPC is usually a shared environment where you have many users on the same system, including externals. It's often directly accessible from the internet. The focus on building it is in speed over security. And you as a user normally don't have much influence on this type of design. And when you access a finished HPC cluster, you might even not be able to change the environment to make it more secure. Um, so. To be clear on which type of applications I will be talking about here, uh, this is applications that run on the Linux command line in HPC environments. That these applications typically do not have any user management and they also do not manage any data storage. Okay, uh, now if we take a look at these type of applications, what are typical vulnerabilities or weak points they have? So um, according to the ISO, a vulnerability is a weakness of the software that can be exploited by a threat such that an event with a negative consequence occurs. So usually you might think here about the bugs, uh, but this also includes uh, design flaws, for example. Um, and now we will go back basically to our um, confidentiality, integrity, availability, CIA. Um, and see where a software could um, affect these three aspects. So if we consider confidentiality, the software might leak input data, intermediate results, or configuration parameters. This could happen when the software is sending user statistics or crash reports to the developers, when it's exchanging information with external websites or databases, also when you automatically write debugging or statistical information to a storage that is accessible by other users. Same goes for temporary files. They could also be in an unprotected location. And also if you transfer data between cluster nodes, uh, this could also impact confidentiality. 
then for integrity, the software might accidentally or even on purpose modify input or temporary data. And this is always uh, can ca cause corruption. So typical example here is when you have multiple invocations of the same program or the same pipeline, they may accidentally write to the same location and then produce a corrupted result. If the software or even the hardware fails during the run and crashes, and it crashes while reading or writing files, this might also corrupt those files. On top of that, a crash might leave incomplete output data. And if it's not clearly visible that this is a crash, then uh, follow-up steps might not realize that the output data is incomplete. And then lastly, availability. Um, so usually the software does not on purposely delete data, but it may accidentally delete data. Um, typical example are when you delete temporary files after you are finished with an analysis. If you are not careful, you might delete uh, other files in the same directory, for example. If you are dealing somehow with permissions, then you could change permissions such that the user don't have access or that additional people have access which should not have access. And of course, you could overwrite files when you save another file. Um, so before I go into like details addressing exactly these points, I mean, already here it might be quite obvious for some of these cases how to prevent this. And this will come also later on in the guidelines. But first I want to talk a bit about general software development best practices, which might not directly influence the security of your software, but definitely do indirectly influence the security. Um, so one best practice is a versioning, which means you should always keep a version history of your code and track all changes that have been made. Ideally, use a version control system like Git for this, where you then have repositories for your data. And you should there also pay attention who has access to that repository and with which permissions. And you should never store any secret data, like encryption keys or similar or passwords in uh, Git repositories. Uh, they also allow you to have a um, defined workflow uh, for the development and also for the change management procedures. So you can enforce pull requests, can enforce schemes like Git flow. And you should also use a versioning scheme such as semantic versioning. So you see an example here. We have these three numbers. The first number is major version, second is minor version, and the third one is patch. This is widely used and accepted and understood by users as a versioning scheme. So how can a workflow with versioning uh, in Git look like? So the light blue track here, for example, is your main branch where you only have uh, the published releases and with their specific versions. Then where you're usually working on is this violet branch that's the development branch. And then, for example, when you want to add a feature, you go into a feature branch, you develop the feature, and you merge it back to the development. Or if you decide to not include the feature, you can just leave the feature branch there, maybe eventually come back to it. If you discover any bugs, you might want to do a hotfix branch and then immediately bring this change back to your main branch with a new version and also your development branch. Then when you think with your development, you're ready to release a new version, you could do a release branch where you, for example, update uh, release nodes, um, where you change the version. You might do some other checks at that point, and then from that, you release a new version. Um, so many of these um, best practices I will mention here kind of are related to each other. They overlap to some extent. So I already mentioned change management, uh, which is something that should also be done. So any changes to the software or its dependencies should be done in a controlled manner following a well-defined procedure. So you should always test and review the code before a new version release. Also test and review updates to dependencies. It's good to maintain an accessible and understandable change history so the user knows what uh, differs from the old version. And you can enforce many of these procedures by rules in Git uh, for merge requests and reviews. 
And it's also common to write contribution guidelines um, so that other people can also contribute and how they can contribute. This uh, increases the long-term sustainability and maintenance of the software. And when you at some point decide you stop the development or you don't have the time anymore, um, then you should put up a deprecation notice so people are aware that there's no development anymore. Uh, so now when you do a new release, it's a good point to do a review or an audit. And so all source code of the software, including external packages, should be reviewed regularly, at least during the release process. There you can use automatic procedures again in Git, for example, like continuous integration, continuous development, which allow you to scan for vulnerabilities in the code and also in the libraries. And for example, to check code quality and other best practice adherence. You should use a single fixed code style, which allows everybody to easily review the code. And you should keep external packages and libraries to a minimum. So if you use external packages, they should at least be very minimal, least amount of functionality. Uh, the less there is, the less to review. You should always read the documentation and disable any unsafe or incomplete functionality and also check all the settings and select settings that are most secure. And never use outdated or deprecated packages or libraries. They might have security vulnerabilities that are not being repaired. And they should always be downloaded from a verified source. So such a review process could look like this. So there's an example of a um, pull request in Git. Um, so you can see, for example, here you see all the different files that have been changed and a quick indication on what the change was. And here you have a detailed overview of uh, what lines were changed, were added. So you can clearly see what, what happened. Uh, on top of that, you have here, for example, checks. <clears throat> so there can be automatic checks each time. And you have a communication, a chat here where you could discuss maybe changes and ask questions. And eventually you can also here approve it <clears throat> and then finally merge it. Okay, I already mentioned a few aspects of automating this. So it's a good idea to automate the building, testing and distribution of your package. Um, this ensures consistent quality and also adherence to all the processes. Um, if you do testing, well, you should do testing, not if. Uh, your testing should uh, cover ideally 80%, at least 80%, ideally 95% of the code, and you should follow best practices there. If you need to use test data, it should be either dummy data or computer generated data, and of course, never real life data or let's say sensitive data. You should also cryptographically design the final tested package so users can verify that the test has not been tampered with. Um, you should use ecosystem specific software package managers to distribute, makes it easier for people to install it and less likely uh, for any errors there. And if you use the automatic procedures, of course, you also need to um, secure those procedures, make sure nobody can uh, tamper them. Um, what you could do with this uh, CICD um, procedures, for example, is a whole lot of tests like unit tests, integration tests, documentation tests, mock deployments, performance tests. You can check um, code best practice. Uh, you can check code formatting and typing. And finally, also there are more advanced tools which allow you to even uh, check uh, vulnerabilities. Um, so a pipeline can look like this, for example. Um, so you see that here are a lot of steps for testing, for example, on different versions of uh, Julia and on Linux, Mac, or Windows, as uh, so different operating systems. You can also automatically generate the documentation and deploy the documentation and like do other testing procedures. This all automatically happens ideally when you before you basically do a release. Um, then another aspect to consider is making your software open source and fair. So fair stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And this allows your software to be easier to find and um, 
users will use it for the particular task they're looking for. Uh, if it's open source, this will allow users and other developers to check themselves the source code to see if they find any vulnerabilities. And it also allows contribution from external developers, which might help you fix problems and security issues. And if you also do a public issue tracker, then users can immediately see what problems are there and what should I pay attention to and can discuss and also discuss solutions. And it also invites contribution from other developers to fix these problems. Um, so usually an issue tracker uh, looks like this. And you can see here the list of different uh, issues. Uh, they don't all need to be bugs. They can also be like feature requests um, or things just improving the quality or improving the documentation. And then here people can discuss uh, these issues and maybe also propose solutions. And then you can assign a developer who will eventually take care of fixing this. Okay, so then um, the GDPR explicitly talks about a security by design. That means to consider potential security issues and systematic mitigations right from the start of the development process, so during the design phase, and not to fix problems afterwards once they are discovered at some point. Uh, therefore, it's also important to choose the right programming language for the task, which makes it easier and more transparent. Um, you can also consider pipeline execution systems, which have a lot of added features um, that um, help with the security. Um, and um, as a, this will be discussed also in the next few slides, um, plan the software such that it endures future extensions without compromising stability and functionality, which usually means writing modular software. So there are isolated parts that are connected by well-defined interfaces. And so you can easily extend it or swap out different parts. And you should also make sure that those individual modules don't grow too big, that there is a cap at some point where you start uh, splitting them up again. Um, so I mentioned before to limit external libraries, but if there is an external library that's well established and well tested uh, for specific tasks, then it's usually best to actually use that library um, because mostly it's better than what you can write yourself. Um, you should also prepare configuration of the software in a way that it does not perform any action um, that might impact the CIA of data without telling the user or without the user explicitly telling the software to do that. Um, and also all the settings should be the most secure um, option by default. If you really want to go all the way, you can of course also do a full formal risk analysis before the development um, and then see immediately where there are potential problems and uh, address them and maybe even make the risk assessment and uh, available to the users for them to do their own assessment. Um, so I already mentioned modularity. So this is basically the same concept here to keep it small and simple. Um, so all the software parts should be uh, focused on a core functionality to also reduce the dependencies where it makes sense. Um, if you have requests or you somehow need to extend the functionality, maybe you don't need to do everything in the core of your software, but you can provide an interface for extension. Um, then either users can um, add extensions or you yourself can write them, but then somehow keep them separate, not maybe deliver them by default or keep them in a separate repository, um, such that the basically the core um, is the like clean and you don't make everything bigger and bigger and more complex and complex. Um, of course, another important aspect is documentation. Uh, the documentation should describe the implementation and the source code layout. And then if people go into the source code, they should also see comments there that explain what uh, the source code is doing. Uh, all the configuration options should be documented and explained what they are doing. And there may be also highlight potential security impacts of those options. Um, also, all data interfaces should be documented like APIs, input formats, outputs formats. Do you have any specific assumptions about the input data? 
Uh, are there any specific properties of the output data that are important? Um, then you should provide a secure usage example so that the user by default starts with these and has a secure way of running it. Um, and if you notice during the development that there are any specific maybe weak points that you are aware of um, that may cause risks, then you can also highlight those in the documentation to the users. And finally, uh, you should provide information for contacting you, the developer, uh, links to issues trackers and guidelines for contributions. Uh, so again, an example here. Um, you can see um, we have here, um, uh, this documentation is um, and what pe many people use is for example, read docs, which can automatically be um, deployed from a Git pipeline. And you will have a documentation that looks like this. Uh, you can see what we have here, for example, is a quick start guide, which is probably the first thing where people want to look at. They want to get started immediately. So there you can provide your secure usage examples. Um, then you can go into more details, more complex examples. Um, and then there's a description of the, how the software actually works and then what functions it has and um, also what programmable interfaces are there. And on top of that, there are also contribution guidelines here. Okay, then a word on containers. Um, so containers are useful if you have complex tools with many dependencies and they can prevent errors installation, in installation and the initial configuration. So you can basically deliver already a, a relatively secure package uh, ready to use to the user. But of course, you add a lot of additional things to your software, which may introduce additional sources of vulnerabilities. Um, so therefore, you should also scan the containers for vulnerabilities if you use them, not just the software itself. Um, also, they need to be kept up to date. And ideally, uh, you also sign them with a checksum so people can again verify they have not been tampered with. And then also here, it's good to be open source and follow fair principles uh, and also publish the recipes on how you build the container so people know basically uh, what, what happened. Okay, then I will switch to the more uh, specific recommendations on how to handle data and applications. So these will mostly directly address the uh, vulnerabilities I highlighted before. Uh, so one obvious category is file operations. So you should never alter input data. So there are applications like Microsoft Word, for example, which obviously alters the input data, but the applications we are talking here usually work in a way that you read your input data, you process it, you write output data separately. Usually it's best to avoid writing temporary files altogether. If you still need to do it for some reason, make sure that they are reliably deleted, that the user uh, can configure where they are so they can be in a secure location and people also inform people that you do that. So they are known to modify the location. Um, if you write data out, so if you write to a file, check that the file doesn't already exist. Never uh, write to existing files. Um, if you write log data, make sure it does not contain details on the process data and ideally do not log by default, uh, but only when the user explicitly requests it. Uh, then another uh, source of uh, problems are data transfers. So again, ideally you should not send any data outside of your computation environment unless the user specifically tells you to. So you should not do any automated database queries to Uniprod, for example, or to download reference sequences. Um, and you should also not send yourself usage information or crash reports. Um, Ideally, you also avoid the exchange of data between processes and nodes of an HPC cluster. Um, if that's unavoidable, it should be at least minimized. Um, and if you do it, then tell the user about it, that you are exchanging information. And so they are aware and might um, double check if this is okay in their environment. Um, so one big topic is always encryption. Um, the regulators always really like it because 
it makes everything very secure, but it's very difficult to handle in most cases and causes some overhead. Um, still, I would recommend that by default you use encryption wherever it's possible. And if you're concerned about performance, just make it an option to disable it if the user is not dealing with sensitive data. That means encrypting inter-process and inter-node communication. Um, <clears throat> also, if you basically send data outside, encrypt it somehow, uh, maybe if you read files, you could offer the option to immediately read encrypted files without the user having to decrypt first and also write encrypted files, for example. Um, and then when you do encryption, again, modularize and make the encryption algorithm exchangeable because they tend to become less secure over time. So eventually you might need to replace it. Uh, then uh, another problem I already mentioned in the vulnerability section is failing. <laughs> so if possible, you should fail, uh, not fail. <laughs> And if you do uh, basically catch the error and uh, handle it properly and tell the user what happened. And then when you handle it, uh, do delete any incomplete output. Uh, in case you somehow cannot do this, you can use another scheme to check if the output is complete, for example, like writing at the end, uh, end of file line or something like uh, this file is finished. Um, if you have trouble, handling crashes, then you can consider wrapping your software in a pipeline system or workflow system that catches the errors for you and then makes the user aware. If you want that to work properly, you need to make sure that you're sending the right exit codes. So never report a failure when you are successful. Then if you are dealing with secrets, well, the, again, the best is to not deal with secrets. <laughs> um, so at least refuse to read or write secrets or encryption keys or any sensitive information from unprotected or unencrypted files or locations. Uh, so basically checking file permissions. Um, so one example here. Uh, so if you connect to HPC cluster, you usually deal with SSH. SSH involves using a key. And if SSH detects that the key in your home directory is not secure in terms of permissions, which just refuse to work. Um, so that's basically good security practice. Um, then if you need to somehow ingest um, from the user this kind of secrets, do it in a way um, that is the least visible to other people. So do not use, uh, for example, options to the comment line because these might be visible to other users or even in the uh, workflow management or in the scheduler. Um, and if you need to store the secrets, you should make sure they're not swapped out of the memory. Okay, so um, these are all the things where you have an influence on. Uh, then let's talk about the environment, which largely you cannot influence. Um, so you should be aware that you cannot control the user, the hardware, the operating system, the HPC environment, the network, and the storage, among other things. So you should do develop your software in a way that you do not rely on these things to be secure somehow. Um, so you should do what you can to, for the software itself to be secured without a, in an insecure environment. If for some reason you need specific um, aspects of the environment to be secure. You have certain assumptions um, or certain configurations that might uh, impact security. You should inform the user about this and say, pay attention in your HPC environment, for example, if this setting is there or not. Um, so you can, for example, do recommendations on user and permission management. Um, you can check permissions of locations where you write the data. Um, and you can, for example, also make suggestions on the properties of HPC jobs. Um, so in some clusters, for example, multiple users could be on the same node, um, but there you can advise users to always reserve a full node for themselves. So it's less likely that other people can see what they are doing. Then the GDPR 
<clears throat> explicitly also mentions operational measures, not only um, technical measures. So these usually boil down to procedures, policies, and things like that. Um, so therefore, you should always train all the developers in data protection requirements. You should all be aware of uh, GDPR, of all the regulations, and have a reasonable understanding of, um, of vulnerabilities and the impacts. Uh, then you should actively raise awareness about uh, current secure development and data management practices. For example, you can share um, training resources uh, with your uh, fellow developers, or if there's a data breach somewhere or vulnerabilities are detected in certain packages, then uh, share this information and inform people about it. If you want to go all the way, you can conduct um, full risk assessment for yourself or also to make it available to the users so they can make their own judgment on whether they trust your software or not. As I already mentioned, you should highlight potential security issues in the documentation. And for all these kind of policies and procedures that you develop for the development, um, for example, for change management, they should really be there in writing um, and such that they can be reviewed regularly and also that they can be checked. So there should be at least once a year a review where you double check if those procedures are followed, if they are still applicable, if they are, if they are missing certain aspects because things change over the time. And then ideally as much of this is automated for example, in Git uh, with the options you have there. Okay, so that's for the main content of the presentation. Um, so you can get the details hopefully soon in the deliverable three, uh, 5.3 on the permit website where all of this is explained in much more detail. My thanks go to uh, my colleagues here at the university, mostly to Mirek, who uh, contributed a lot to this deliverable. Um, so he is our Coprexa developer, which, have you, which you have seen in many of the examples. And then also thanks to all the reviewers of the deliverable who also helped to uh, basically make it what it is now. And then thank you very much for your attention. And um, if you have any questions, then I think Daniel will tell you how to ask them. Yes, thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much for the uh, presentation. Uh, yes, please, if you have any questions, use the Q&A button that is in your Zoom panel um, to uh, write any questions you may have. Um, until we get some questions, I, I wanted to ask something. So you were asking, you were saying at the beginning uh, that when you are uh, to, uh, testing new releases of the software uh, that you should always do the test of the release of the new software and also at the end you were mentioning doing the risk assessments do you think it makes a difference or is it better or worse if you do that uh, yourself or your own team or if you pass that uh, function to someone else either informally or like formally hiring someone else who does that the risk assessment and the testing? Uh, it very much depends. So, um, of course, formal risk assessment is uh, quite complicated to go into. So maybe there it's um, it's also, if you do not have yet, yet a good framework, it might be hard to already hire somebody uh, for doing that. Uh, but once you have already um, a good framework and the basis, and um, also all the code. Uh, at that point, I think it makes sense to hire somebody externally, maybe if you can afford it to review it and also to do uh, a proper uh, risk analysis. Um, also maybe including your environment and uh, all your processes. Uh, usually those should be in place already because otherwise the, the external will just say, yeah, you need these policies, you need this process and, and this kind of things because they also look at not the technical side, but usually also all the uh, procedures. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a few questions already coming in. So the first one is, uh, thanks for a very interesting session. If I want to do provenance of the final output, 
backtracking all back tracing all the changes that the input went through how will it be compatible with keeping the data secure do you have any advice on making data provenance secure if you need to oh yeah yeah it's okay it's a, it's a tough question um so um ideally you have everything basically in um in a secure location and when you do the provenance basically all this information you collect there should also be in a secure location ideally also in a separate location than uh, the original data because one of the principles i didn't manage in gdpr is also to separate the data um so different kinds of data and specifically there it helps if you have for example a workflow management system which usually tracks uh, all the changes you do uh, and why, at least it tracks all the software you use which version and what parameters uh, you specified usually this information mostly is not sensitive only your input and your output data so you need to make like um need to see what this the provenance information actually contains and whether that needs to be kept secure or not okay perfect we have another question is there any key, anything in gdpr that indicates a shared hpc is essentially not secure enough for sensitive human genetic data yeah i mean gdpr as you have seen uh, from what I listed is very general, let's say. So of course it does not really is very specific. Let's say here we came to the conclusion that usually a shared HPC as it is, is not secure enough because usually one permission change on the wrong folder makes this folder accessible to all HPC users, for example. Uh, so there's one tiny mistake you make when when creating a new folder everybody can read it um that's not very secure let's say so what we do for hpc we recommend to have the data always encrypted okay okay good to know <laughs> um okay we have another question for very small research groups which are which are the easiest or cheap procedures they should apply from uh, all the battery that you have recommended. Uh, um, well, I say start with open source, um, because then if you cannot cover things, users can at least double check and make their own assessments. Um, and they will then also, if you have, for example, a public issue tracker, if people, if you don't, do not have the capacity to check everything, if other people notice problems, they can at least alert you to those problems. Um, um, yes, I would say do a Git repository, make it open source. Okay. Okay. And then Perfect. you can build on top of that, basically step-by-step -step adding more of the Git features to, to increase the things. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, so I had another question. You you mentioned that the, the temporary files to make sure that they are reliably deleted. So um, are there any tools you can rely on that can help you with that to make sure that they are reliably deleted? Um, yeah, it's actually, um, this is very difficult. Um, so um i mean usually one thing you do is you make sure you basically somehow um, randomly generate a folder name um and then um, put your data there uh, and then you can be pretty sure that you can delete this folder afterwards uh, assuming you can handle the crash uh, otherwise the workflow management system might take care of that um then there's also the possibility to to basically alert the user if something fails that the user knows he should check the folder and to manually delete maybe if there's anything there. Um, then not so much in your power, but for example, for Slurm, there exist plugins that uh, take care of that by creating per job temporary directories and deleting them when the job finishes. So that's the ideal case, but that's again a case where maybe you as the user don't have the power to um, cause your HPC team to implement this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. 
Okay, we still have some time for questions. So use the Q&A button. Meanwhile, I'm just going to share my screen for a moment. Yeah, so you can still use that button for questions. Um, just very quickly, just to let everyone know, announce about the uh, future sessions that we are going to have in the Permit COE. So if you go to the website, Besides watching the recordings of previous webinars, as always, we also had a previous webinar with, with Sarah some months back. Um, you can already sign up for the one that will happen in June about utilizing uh, GPUs in scientific algorithms. And we will also have one session in September with uh, Professor Joaquin Dopazo. So that will be uh, soon available uh, for everyone to sign up. And uh, let me just put the link in the chat for everyone if you want to go there directly. Um, another question I wanted to ask is uh, when you said about properly handle exceptions and crashes and making clear to the user what happened. Uh, so how should you make that clear? How should that be communicated in the short term when it just happened and keeping track for the long term? Is there any specific best practices to follow for that? Uh, yeah, maybe Mirek has more recommendations on that. <laughs> Mirek, yeah. Comments? Yeah. yeah, I can comment probably. Hello, everyone. I'm Mirek Uh Yeah, uh, the exceptions are a problem because the like, especially like combinations of the exception and combinations of all errors that can bubble up uh, through the programs, especially if the programs are like uh, complex. Uh, that area is not like only complex to tackle, but also kind of unexplored from the from the like computer science perspective. Like only now there are like actual algebras to handle the exceptions, for example, and see how the exceptions can actually combine. Um, uh, yeah, it's uh, actually hard to do properly in a general case, but luckily we don't usually have the general case. Usually the software is some kind of Unix program which can report the exception, which which can report the problems very easily. Uh, usually, if you are programming Python, if you're programming C++ or something, you usually have some kind of exception system uh, in there, which you can use to reliably throw errors and catch them somewhere uh, upwards. Uh, as a first recommendation, it's the best thing you can do is like, if the problem is seriously an exception, if you hit an error, do not catch it, just throw it away, uh, throw it as high as possible and make sure that the user notices it. What uh, I usually do is to literally deny any like intermediate catching of exceptions in the programs because that creates the risk that you miss some kind of problem in the program, uh, creates the risk that something gets wrong, creates the risk that something gets unnoticed by the user, and in the end the data is gonna get damaged. Data is gonna be, to, you know, uh, there, there's gonna be some problem that you won't notice, and uh, it's going to create a problem later. Outside of the programs, you can report the exceptions using the, for example, exit codes. Exit codes are pretty standard, supported everywhere. Uh, you can go for like exit code processing by the uh, workflow managers or even by Slurm or even by the uh, huge batch systems, uh, which is usually reliable because the software has been tested very throughout. It's uh, deployed for like forever on the clusters already. So there you will be able to see the exception. You will be able to see that something has happened and no, will, no problem will pass unnoticed, which is literally the most uh, complicated thing that uh, you want to prevent. Uh, other than that, if you have software that, for example, uses the exceptions to communicate, the software might be just problematic to handle correctly, and that happens very often. Uh, people kind of misuse the exceptions for communicating like minor stuff, like I didn't find something in the area or the dictionary doesn't contain an ID or something. Uh, some of those are problematic exceptions, many of those aren't. If you have software like this, you need to be very careful. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Mirek. Anything to add, Sarah, to that, to that answer? Okay, so we don't have any more questions, so I, I'm going to yeah, conclude the webinar. Thank you very much, Sarah, for the very nice presentation, and Mirek also for, for contributing to the, to the questions. Uh, thank you all attendees for participating, and see you in the next session of the webinar series. Have a nice day.